Greetings from the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta and Canada, which is the traditional home of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Tsotina Nation, and the Stony Nakoda. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. My name is Darren Flynn. I'm a linguist at the University of Calgary. And my co-presenter today is Cody Tufts, who is a graduate student in linguistics. We're just so thrilled to have been invited to this International Conference on Language Documentation and Conservation. The title of our presentation is Language Documentation in Rome Research, Recognizing Relationships in Field Notes. Rome is an online app that Cody and I and a few other students have been using to keep our field notes in our work with the tremendous uh, community linguist, Miss Florence St. Pierre. She's from Wollaston Lake in Saskatchewan and a fluent speaker of Dene saint -Hiné. So at this point, I'm going to let Cody take over with a demonstration of this app. Rome Research is an online note-taking application. As such, it has all the basic functionality of a text editor. One of the things that makes Rome different is the ability to quickly and easily form connections between new and existing notes. So if I enter a new note under today's date, meeting between Cody and Darren regarding our ICLDC presentation, I can easily mark specific words in one of two different ways, either with double brackets or with a hashtag. And in so doing, I've created a link between this and all other notes in our database featuring these terms. You'll notice here I've selected Dene Saint Chine from a drop-down list. This indicates that a page under this heading already exists in the database. If I click on Dene Solchine, it now functions as a link to the existing page under that name, which you can see here, and on which I've listed some basic information on the language. For instance, Dene Solchine has the second largest speaker population of all the Dene languages, next only to Navajo, with approximately 15,000 speakers and the Dene Salchine communities are distributed across the provinces of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, and the Northwest Territories. Needless to say, the Dene Salchine people represent a very important linguistic and cultural community in these areas. Here, I can illustrate another of Rome's features, which is the ability to incorporate information from any one page in the database to any other page in the form of a block reference. In fact, these two blocks of information on Dene saint -Chine are block references taken from a page outlining the introductory chapter of Cook's 2004 Grammar of the Language. By clicking on either of these blocks, I can open up this source page in a sidebar, allowing me to view both pages simultaneously. Scrolling down, we can see the reference block highlighted in yellow here in its original context. I should point out that these two bullet points on the left are not just copied from Cook's introduction. Rather, they're better described as mirroring the referenced information. Thus, if I were to make a change to the source, this change is reflected in the mirrored blocks as well. This number one next to the source block indicates the number of times which this block has been referenced elsewhere in the database. By clicking on it, I can view details of the pages and contexts in which it has been referenced. And here, of course, we see it has been referenced on the page Denis Solchine, which we see to the left. What this also illustrates is the fact that the links formed by referencing in this way are bi-directional. You can follow them from the referencing page to the source page, or vice versa. Now, as one can imagine, in a database of considerable size, it's necessary to have some means of locating desired information. If we fast forward to the future, on February 27th, 2022, I may want to pull up those presentation notes Darren and I made a year prior. In this case, I can use an AND query function. If I enter my name and ICLDC7 as the search string, the query will return all pages in the database with links to those two terms. And here we see the page future me is looking for with meeting notes from February 11th, 2021. And I can follow this link back to that page. 
Now that I've illustrated some of Roam's basic functionality, let's take a look at how we used Roam in our language documentation project. I will open another query, this time entering Tana, the name of a fellow student, and the word negation as the search string. This returns a page from December 8th, on which Tana recorded the results of an elicitation session. On December 8th, Florence was helping Tana with her goal to learn more about the expression of negation in Dene Salchine. On this page, we find examples of the visuals Tana created and used to guide the elicitation, audio recordings of Florence's responses, and transcriptions of those responses. Audio and image files can be conveniently dragged and dropped directly into the notes. Scrolling down, we see some of Tana's transcriptions. She's provided a literal gloss for the basic meaning of this sentence here. One side dog have. But it seems like she still had some questions. Looking to the right, we again see the number indicating that this block of text has been referenced elsewhere in the database. Clicking on this number one, expands details on the referencing pages directly below the source block. I'll zoom in for a better look. Here we see that on January 27th, I was taking a look at the recorded sentences Florence provided Tana on December 8th. I included Tana's original block in my own note on the 27th as a block reference. This allowed me to add my thoughts to Tana's note without altering the original in any way. Here as well, we see my own attempt at a transcription, gloss, and translation, as well as a longish list of questions beneath. I had questions, for example, on the nature of these two items, klis and kla. While I look forward to learning more about the meanings of these words from Florence in the future, in the meantime, I've noted below that, given the context, klis potentially means picture. I've also noted that I'm unsure of the meaning and the proper transcription of this item, kla. However, if I expand this bullet, we can see that I was exploring the possibility that it may mean one, and I was able to include a reference from Cook's grammar of some formally similar words with this meaning. To the right, once again we see the number indicating that this note has itself been referenced elsewhere in the database. Clicking on this indicator, we see that on February 3rd, Darren made his own contribution to this discussion. Here, Darren points to the existence of tlis as a verb stem in a form like heret tlis, he or she is painting, and wonders whether or not it could be the case that this word underwent a change in form when combined with diri, the word meaning this. I should point out here that in addition to referencing my note on tlis, several other items Darren mentions in his note, such as the word heret tlis and its translation, are themselves references to pages elsewhere in the database. I hope that this illustration gives an idea of the interconnectedness of the database and the ways in which this interconnectedness and the ease with which new connections can be made facilitates the discovery of meaningful relationships between entries. If I click on the link for the word I've transcribed as tlis, this takes me to an empty page with this heading. Indeed, every time a unique link is added to the database, a corresponding page is formed. While in the future, I may want to add additional details to this page on the meaning of this word, these pages are useful in and of themselves to get an overview of where the word or phrase in question appears throughout the database. At the bottom of each page is a list of two types of references. The first are known as linked references and comprise the entire list of pages within the database to which a formal link has been created using the methods we've seen so far. Beneath this list is an additional list of references unlinked references, which represents the full list of pages on which this form, tlis, appears, but for which no formal link has been created. The link button on the right gives us the option to quickly form a link to any of these pages if we so choose, at which point the page is added to the list of linked references. Returning to my notes from January 27th. Let's take a look at another of my questions, which illustrates one of the interesting qualities of Dene Solchine. Scrolling to the right of this table, we find my attempt at an analysis of the internal structure of the verb in Florence's sentence. Dene Solchine and the Dene languages generally have verbs of great complexity. 
gaining a better understanding of the ways in which these complex verbs are used and the meanings and functions of their various parts is one of the things that I personally am interested to learn more about. Taking a look at this gloss, one point in particular on which I have questions is the nature of this element, E. which I've glossed as contributing the meaning imperfective third-person subject, reflecting the fact that it is a singular third-person entity, in this case a dog, doing the sitting, and that the state of sitting is ongoing, it's not complete. Following the link for E brings us to an empty page, just as we saw earlier with the example of Kies. And again, as in that example, we can view the list of pages referencing this form. I'll just clean up some of these pages. Now, if you recall, I had suggested E might mean imperfective third person singular subject based on the context in which I had encountered it. However, browsing through the list of linked references reveals that here in a dictionary entry, we have the form E glossed as imperfective first person singular subject rather than third person. In the very next page, from a different source, we find it has been glossed as perfective first-person singular subject, indicating a complete action rather than an incomplete one. Continuing, we see that uh, in this word, Cook has glossed E as simply indicating a first-person singular subject. And further down, we see a couple more examples of perfective first-person singular subject. So a quick look through the database seems to reveal that this form can mean several different things depending on the verb in which it is used. Similarly, if we follow the link for a specific meaning as opposed to a specific form, for example, first person subject, and take a look at the various pages in which this meaning has been referenced. Here we find that in this first verb, agreement with a first person subject is said to be indicated by the form while in the form below, the same meaning is said to be indicated by the form E. And here below again, we find some more examples of first person subject indicated by the form S. While in the previous example, we saw that a single form might have multiple meanings, these examples illustrate that a single meaning may also be indicated by multiple forms. To look at one more example, if we return again to the verb which I was attempting to gloss, and this time, instead of following the link for the form, E, we follow the link for the glossed meaning, imperfective third singular subject. And if we take a look at the various pages in which this glossed meaning is referenced, in this first example, we find that this meaning is said to be indicated by a high tone. While uh, in this example, from another source, we find the same meaning indicated by the prefix ni. And in the next example, by a null prefix, or the absence of a prefix, and in the verb below this, by the form e. And scrolling down further, we find yet another form. In this verb, imperfective third singular subject is said to be marked by nasality. So this provides yet another example of Denis Sanchenet's complex form meaning relationships. I hope that in addition to illustrating some of the interesting qualities of Denis Sanchenet, I've also shown some of the ways in which the functionality and organization of our Rome database allows us to explore these types of complexities, to learn something about them, and to contribute to the documentation of this important language. Thank you, Cody, for that demonstration. This is Darren again. Cody and I wanted to bring this note-taking app to your attention. We thought it might be helpful to some of you, but we also wanted to clarify that, you know, we're not salespeople. We have no affiliation to Rome. We've shared some of the pros. Uh, there are also cons, such as the price. You know, I pay seven bucks per month, and it's more of an online app as opposed to a desktop app. And it doesn't work perfectly with the multiple users at the same time. And of course, it needs to be compared with other products that are widely used in language documentation, such as the apps put out by SIL. So Cody and I really look forward to your questions, some of which might take the form, does Rome do this or that? And we'll say no or yes. And of course, we look forward to your own experiences and suggestions of technology to support language documentation and description. Thanks again so much for your invitation.